Happy New Year, church. It's a joy to celebrate this, this first Sunday of 2022 with you as we uh, celebrate all that God has, has given us and even as God has just been with us through the trials of the last year, the last two years, and where God is still with us even as we, as we face another year beginning in pandemic, as we uh, face another year in, um, in looking forward and seeing where, where it is that God is, is creating a space for us. So we, we welcome you. This is Wellspring. This is the place where all are welcome, all are accepted, and all always means all. And we're so, so glad to have you joining us with us in this sacred space. We want to, uh, to invite you to use the See More link uh, in your Facebook description. It's S-E-E-M-O-R-E. -E. Click that link and it, it opens up a lot of, uh, a lot of things that, that'll really tell you about our church and who we are. It's a way for you to register, your, your, a link for you to be able to register your attendance and to make your gift. There's also, uh, there are also links for other things that are going on in the life of the church. Two of those things are a disciple's path, and uh, it, which is uh, a course that starts on January 9th, and uh, there is a, uh, a link that gives you information and a place to register for that. And a disciple's path is a, is a course that is for those who are interested in learning more about Wellspring, learning more about United Methodism, learning more about who we are, and so it's an opportunity for you to do this seven-week course. And then also we have a um, uh, Stephen, ministry, Stephen ministry training that is coming up. And there is a link there that gives you more uh, information and a way to register for the training, sign up for the training there. As we begin this service, one of the things that, uh, that we, we is, is really an important part of the new year. A on the first Sunday of the year, we celebrate Holy Communion as we do on the first Sunday of each month. And what we do is invite you at home to find those elements that, are, that, that remind you of body and blood, whether it's bread and juice, bread and wine, whether it's something that just, that, that just reminds you of Christ in your life. And so this is uh, the way that we come together and we, we experience communion even though we're digitally connected online and not just in person, but still we are connected. We are the people of God. So that's why we're here, to worship God who brings us into this new year, who reveals this Christ to us, who says, I am with you always and I will lead you in paths that may surprise you and bless you in so many ways in the coming days. So let's worship God together. This is a reading from the 60th chapter of Isaiah. 
verses 1 through 6. I am Steve Bukley. In today's reading, uh, the prophet Isaiah foretells a time when God's people will arise from their darkness and shine to the glory of God. Isaiah writes, Arise, shine, for your light is come, and the glory of the Lord rises upon you. See, darkness covers the earth, and thick darkness is over the peoples. But the Lord rises among you, and his glory appears over you. Nations will come to your light, and kings to the brightness of your dawn. Lift up your eyes and look around you, and all assemble and all come to you. Your sons come from afar, and your daughters are carried on the hip. Then you shall look and be radiant, and your hearts will throb and swell with joy. The wealth on the seas will be brought to you. Mm. To you the riches of the nations will come. Herds of camels will cover, will cover your land, young camels of Midian and Ephra. And from Sheba will come bearing gold and incense, and proclaiming the praise of the Lord. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our scripture today is from the Gospel of Matthew, second chapter, verses 1 through 12. In the time of King Herod, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, wise men came from the east to Jerusalem, saying, Where is the child who has been born the king of the Jews? 
for we observe this star at its rising and have come to pay him homage. When King Herod heard this, he was frightened and all of Jerusalem with him. And calling together all the chief priests and scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Messiah was to be born. And they told him, in Bethlehem of Judea, for so it has been written by the prophet. And you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means among the, the rulers, the least of, among the rulers of Judah. For from you shall come a ruler who is the shepherd of my people Israel. Then Herod secretly called for the wise men and learned from them the exact time when the star had appeared. Then he sent them to Jerusalem, to Bethlehem, saying, Go and search diligently for the child, and when you have found him, bring me word so that I may also go and pay him homage. When they heard the king, they set out, and there ahead of them went the star that they had seen at its rising, until it stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw that the star had stopped, they were overwhelmed with joy. On entering the house, they saw the child with Mary his mother, and they knelt down and paid him homage. Then opening their treasure chest, they offered him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And having been warned in a dream not to return to Herod, they left for their own country by another road. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Archbishop Desmond Tutu was a person who transformed the world. He was born into poverty in a South Africa defined by, a rule of, by the rule of a white minority. He was one, however, who was destined to be a leader, yet his journey to the role as archbishop uh, 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 took many turns. He suffered from tuberculosis as a child and spent more than a year in the hospital. He intended to go into medicine and, and was accepted at medical school, but his parents simply couldn't afford the cost of that education. <clears throat> because the government uh, gave out scholarships for teachers, he decided that would be the route he would take, so he accepted an opportunity to be educated as a teacher. And he became a, a, a teacher that was well-loved and well-known, and then he was horrified by the 1953 Bantu uh, Education Act that completely segregated education in the nation. And as he, as he struggled with that, he finally resigned in protest. It was shortly after that that he was approached by the Anglican Bishop of Johannesburg uh, who, who approached Tutu about the priesthood. Since few black South Africans were educated, the bishop saw an opportunity for Desmond Tutu to be of influence in the church uh, and in South Africa as a priest. So Tutu was, was ordained in 1960. And from an early time in his ministry, he sought a new pathway for all South Africans. He stood with the marginalized and the poor in chorus with a host of people who defined civil rights in the 20th and 21st century. So his death the day after Christmas marks a passing of another of the great saints of the past 100 years. People that included Gandhi, that included Martin Luther King, that included Mother Teresa. So as I read what was said of him at his funeral, it was uh, South African President Cyril uh, Ramaphosa who said that Archbishop Desmond Tutu has been our moral compass and national con conscience. Ramaphosa said he saw our country as a rainbow nation emerging from the shadow of, of apartheid, united in its diversity with freedom and equal rights for all. But as I read all the things about Bishop, uh, Archbishop Desmond Tutu's um, funeral, the one thing that stood out for me was the way even in his death he stood in solidarity with the poor. He asked prior to his death that his casket be the cheapest wooden casket that could be bought. And then he wanted a simple ceremony at St. George's Cathedral with no more than 100 people in attendance in order to be able to comply with the COVID protocols. He was caring for others. Even in his death, he was in solidarity with the oppressed. And as I read all these things about Desmond Tutu, 
it occurred to me that his life and his death highlights the story of the second Sunday of Christmas and the story of the Epiphany. You see, the, the, as, we, as we come out of Christmas, we come out of Christmas for 12 days, and then on January 6th there's always the day of Epiphany. And so as we look at that, um, we, we see where Christ is revealed. That's what this is about. And while we are so much more content, folks, to stop with the cozy story of the birth of Jesus, the real story about the power of Christ to, tra- to, to transform our world is borne out in people like Archbishop Desmond Tutu. It's a story of a God who stands in solidarity, not with people of power, but the poor and the marginalized. It's a story of what it means to come into the story from one perspective only to find a surprising pathway where God is leading. It's to stand before principalities and powers and speak of a God who is made known not by our privilege and our power, but who is made known in the poor, in in our own weakness, in our own suffering, in our own death. It's to come into the story one way and then by the power of God to go home by another way. Let us pray. God, you are the one who comes with us, who is revealed to us in this time. You're the one who who calls us to consider pathways that lead to justice and hope and peace. You're the one who calls us to follow this Christ who is revealed to us, not in magnificent splendor, but in the simplicity of, of poverty. So be with us now as we worship and may the words that we share here together and the meditations of our collective heart somehow be acceptable in your sight. For you, O God, are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. So as we read the story once again of <clears throat> of uh, the, the Magi who come and, and it, Magi are really, that's, a, that's the epiphany story. Uh, what we find is Herod is, it was the one in power. He was the son of Antipater, the, the Idumean, who was a high-ranking Roman official and who had good standing, uh, had a very good standing relationship with Julius Caesar. It's a story of deceit and intrigue. And in this story, Herod has gone to Rome in 41 BCE, so uh, before, well before the, uh, the, the, the birth of Jesus. Uh, he's gone to Rome to plead with the Roman government <clears throat> to, <clears throat> excuse me, to bring peace to the area of Judea. When Herod was there, he was unexpectedly named king of the Jews. <clears throat> Herod was known as a great builder, and he had erected the second temple in an effort to gain acceptance among his Jewish subjects. He had built the two great fortresses of Herodium and Masada, He built the great cities of Caesarea Maritima or Caesarea by the sea and he had built a magnificent tribute to the Jewish patriarchs in Hebron. The text from Matthew tells us that the Magi, literally Magoi is the word from which we derive our word uh, magic, came from the east. Literally, uh, Apo Anatalon, which is more literally transferred from the rising of the sun. These are likely astrologers connected to Zoroastrianism or a similar pagan religion. And while I hate to ruin our nativity sets and creches, there's actually nothing in these texts that limits their number to three other than the number of gifts. This is, uh, was an unusual group of mystics and priests that represent this mystical, contemplative perspective and perhaps a recognition that this newborn Jewish baby will somehow serve as a global connection between the ancient God of the Hebrews and the entirety of creation. This idea will later be picked up uh, in the Gospel of John where we hear Jesus say, I have other sheep that do not belong to this fold. For Matthew, this is a story of an infant rival of Herod that depicts the one truth that was known about Herod the Great, his fears of being usurped by another one who is called, in this text, the King of the Jews. That was Herod's title. And we're told here that Herod was frightened at what he heard from the Magi, this, the mystic sages, and he called the chief priest and the scribes, meaning the religious leaders he himself had appointed, 
and asked them to help him solve the puzzle of where this rival was to be born. Matthew continues the story of the Magi, how they, they followed the star and followed the directions that were given by the, by the priest of, uh, uh, that, that Herod had brought out. And they found this infant Jesus and brought gifts of gold, frankincense, myrrh. During Christmas this year, uh, my grandchildren reminded me once more that such gifts were probably not necessarily appreciated by the children. <laughs> so it's important to understand the significance of these gifts. While the gifts may represent different things, the early Christian uh, scholar and mystic Origen Adamantius defined this as the place where things of this world, gold, Meet God, frankincense, this, this mystic uh, incense that reminds us of, of God. And it also blends with the idea with this myrrh that somehow God connects with us through our death, which is itself the ultimate expression of our powerlessness and ultimate dependence upon God. It's where the Creator is connected intimately with the creation. As we embark upon this new year, this story seems so important for me. First, I think we need to talk again about fear. I've talked about this before. This is something that I even started 2021 with. During this year of pandemic, we've experienced continued racial strife, cultural shifts, and during this time, we, friends, cannot afford to be driven by fear. What we've discovered in human society and what's been borne out again this year is that fear combined with power is rarely a good combination for, for humanity, for our globe. It's a big part of the darkness surrounding Jesus' birth, and it's a big part of the darkness that has surrounded our nation and our world. Fear of weakness leads to abuses of power. Fear of scarcity leads to the deprivation of resources for the poor and those whom we would consider other. Fear of violence leads not to peace, but to greater violence. And the fear of dying leads us not to life, but finally to the place of despair and darkness. So as we come out of another challenging year, my prayer is that we will not be guided by fear of the future. Rather, we will be guided by faith. That was the gift of the Magi. They were willing to follow the light of a star without knowing where it was leading them. The connection between the passage from Isaiah and the story of the Magi to me is obvious. But there's something that's less obvious. It's the role of seeing. The passage from Isaiah has this section that is not just about being, but it's about seeing. Lift up your eyes and look around. They all gather together. They come to you. Your sons shall come from far away and your daughters shall be carried on their nurses' arms. Then you shall see and be radiant. Your heart shall thrill and rejoice because the abundance of the sea shall be brought to you and the wealth of the nations shall come to you. When we see God at work in our world, when we see the fingerprint of God on every single part of creation and in every single person, when we see how God is calling us to reflect this light that shone in our darkness, while we often use the word seer, S-E-E-R, to talk about mystics and physics, uh, or pardon me, mystics and psychics, it really has to do with opening our eyes to see where God is calling us. It is about seeing our way forward. That's the significance also of the season known as Epiphany. It's a time when God is made known to us and all we have to do is open our eyes and see. We went through the entire season of Advent talking about awakening. And it's to see where God is at work and where God is leading us. Which finds me, finally leads me to the other perhaps more important learning for me that uh, is described in this story. It's about the fact that the Magi were willing to listen to God. And after they had brought their gifts to Jesus, it was God who told them to go home by another way. 
Herod, the symbol of power in this narrative, is living out his fear by attempting to eliminate his rival. But God had other plans. The Magi did not go out the same way they came in. Friends, this is perhaps the greatest learning for us, again, in this season of pandemic and cultural shift. As we begin this year, I want every, everyone to hear that the last two years have not left us, uh, will, will not leave us unchanged. We are people who are a very different people. Our church is a very different church. There are many people in our world, including many clergy and leaders, who are still anxiously looking for us to get back to normal, whatever that is. And one of the things that I know through, through grief coaching and through end-of-life coaching is that, that, there is, that there's not going back to normal. There's going to some new normal. And here's the truth that I know. Like the Magi, we're not going back the same way we came in. And while we really don't know where God is leading us here at Wellspring, we don't know where God is leading us in our lives, it's obvious that we've connected with so many people from everywhere around the globe. We feel a, a sense of connection with our sense of radical hospitality and the message we're speaking about, this radical type of inclusiveness that resembles that of Dr. Martin Luther King, John Lewis, Desmond Tutu the ones that they envisioned, this inclusiveness. It's an inclusiveness that does not leave out the oppressed and really doesn't even leave out the oppressor. The commission on truth and reconciliation that Desmond Tutu led was one that, that sought to bring both the abused and the abuser to the table and to say, we can be here in this together and we will hold one another accountable. And yet we see you. We still see God's fingerprint in you, even though we may, we may feel crushed by you. And it's a vision of what it means to be the embodiment of Christ on this earth. And as Jesus, uh, as, as in Jesus, we have this image of an incarnate God who connects the creator to creation. We're called to live in such a way that we provide the greatest example of what it means when we face the darkness in our world today as those who see and follow this God on a journey that will most definitely take us home by another way. So... I think it's interesting. We, we uh, so often, the 26th, I saw all the lights coming down and things happening and, you know, the, the stores are all redecorated for, for probably Valentine's Day. And um, December 25th comes and goes and the world stops looking. We sing the 12 days of uh, the, the Christmas carol, the 12 days of Christmas, while having absolutely no idea of its meaning. But when we open our eyes, we realize that it's here that we see this infant celebrated in the just, just a few days ago, eight, nine days ago. And we're the one, we're connected with this God who connects with us in our darkness, in the place of death. That would be the significance, you see, of the myrrh. And if we follow Origen's understanding of these gifts, it will take us to a new understanding of the cross. For as Jesus faced the darkness of the cross, he also was capable of seeing something much larger. He was capable of seeing where God was leading. So where is God leading us in this year? I invite you to look deeply. I think it's going to take us home by another way if we will have the faith to follow. You see, the greatest example that we have from Archbishop Desmond Tutu is the impact that he made on the people in South Africa, but around the world. And George Brightwell shared with me uh, just yesterday a, uh, an, an email that came from uh, his, uh, their, their niece and her husband, uh, Manfred, had sent this, uh, this incredible reflection on what, what they in South Africa call the arch this person who came into their world, who rose from this, this place of poverty, who spoke truth to power, 
who led a time of reconciliation and peace and understanding that it's still not done, that it's still tenuous, that it still tends to fall apart. There's still the example of this one who is called Arch, the Arch. And in the final analysis, as we look at his life, his final message to us is a message of, of letting go of all the trappings, of letting go of all the things that bind us and finding God in our weakness, not in our greatness. And when we come to God poor, when we come to God helpless, when we stand in front of the throne with nothing to define us except the grace of God, it will take us home by another way. And we can rest assured that God will be part of our journey every single step of the way. Amen. So on the night in which Jesus gave himself up for us, he took bread. 
he broke the bread and gave it to his disciples and said, take and eat. This is my body that's broken for you. The ultimate symbol of poverty, the ultimate symbol of self-giving and sacrifice. Jesus gave himself fully for us. May we see that in this season. And after supper, Jesus took the cup. And he said, this is my blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so the ultimate outpouring of self is not just death. But it's the lifeblood of Christ that is poured not just out, but is poured out into us, is given to us. And every time we consume this, we're challenged to remember the gift that is the gift of Christ in this world. Let us pray. We pray, O oh God, that you bless these gifts, this bread and this wine, that truly we might experience it as your body and your blood flowing through our veins. We pray, O oh God, that you bless us, that we might truly be the body of Christ, redeemed by Christ's blood, that we might experience a new life, that we might experience a new way, that we might experience a new hope, and that we might understand that the way we come into this world is not the way we go out. That we come in, we come in taking and holding and we go out by letting go and understanding that somehow, somehow in the midst of it you are here. So bless these elements, bless us who receive and we pray, oh God, that you bless all who experience this, this gift of your presence through Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. So take that which is the symbol of the body of Christ. Take that, my friends, and eat. And then take that, which is the symbol of the blood of Christ. Christ, life poured into you. Take and drink. On behalf of the uh, of Wellspring, thank you for the ways that you helped us to um, to meet our our ministry goals in the last year. Uh, we had a year that um, was was challenging, and yet you, the church, stepped up to the challenge. And so we look forward to to the ways that we will do ministry together in the days ahead. 
And one of the things that we realize is that it comes with that particular form of the outpouring of self that is our financial giving. And so these plates represent that uh, the, 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 the place where we, we give our gifts. You give online, you give by mailing a check, uh, but your gift is so appreciated and it's taken as an offering, as an offering to God. And then when we receive that, we use it that way. We use it as a, as a way to further the, the kingdom of God in this world in so many ways. So friends, let us pray. God, bless those who give. Bless those who receive. We pray that the gifts that we share here as we embark upon this new year will be gifts of, of powerful transformation and change that we might further the, the cause of Christ in this world, that the body of Christ might become stronger. So we, we pray that you bless us, bless these gifts, bless all that we might be Christ and see Christ in this world. Through Christ our Lord, amen. So how about it, church? As we, move, as we move out of 2021, what's the new direction? What's the way that, that God is leading us? How is God leading us home by another way? This is an opportunity for us to respond as we, as we seek to follow Christ into 2022. As we seek to follow Christ into wherever it is that God surprisingly leads us. This is, this is the opportunity for us to see Christ and for us to be Christ in this world. So let's respond as we sing. Ages of 
So friends, as we part from this this space, we part knowing that God is leading. So this is an opportunity for you to um, to, to take that and go into the world and begin to see, see Christ, to be awakened, as we talked about in Advent, to all of the things that God is doing in our world, to see where it is that God brings us to a place of hope, in peace, that we might live out a legacy, the legacy of Desmond Tutu, the legacy of so many who have gone before. And in living out that legacy, the world might be changed. So go be the church in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.